we move on to topic four. In topic three, we were looking at the writing tips and traps. And we talked about the styles and types of writing and the key characteristics of academic writing. For our topic four, we want to look at the postgraduate standard of writing. Now, it is expected that at postgraduate level, you're not going to do the kind of writing that you did at the undergraduate level. You should be better than the undergraduate level. So at postgraduate level, it is expected that you're going to write assignments that are technical. They are technically correct with regard to the adherence to the academic conventions. They also, your assignments must also be coherent in organization of ideas and presentation of the arguments. Your assignments must also be cohesive in structure. And they have to be, co they have to be scholarly in content and equally in style. Now you should also be able to consult the assessment criteria that is used for your program. Like in the School of Education, we have a way in which we present our assignments. And that should be provided to you by the course lecturer, even as you will be progressing on. When it comes to the writing of the thesis or the project, we have the Mount Kenya University Student's Handbook that will guide you with regard to the content that you're going to include in your project or in your thesis. Now the basics of written presentations involve punctuations. It involves how to write numbers in an essay or an assignment, how to use particular apostrophes, how to use certain foreign words and phrases with abbreviations, how to use footnotes and endnotes. All these must be put into perspective when it comes to the postgraduate standard of writing. For instance, when do you use a full stop? When do you use a comma? What are some of the foreign words that you're going to include in your writing? Like the word et cetera, ETC. Do you understand where it comes from? And where in particular in your statement or in your sentence is it supposed to apply? So such kind of issues must be addressed and well understood when it comes to postgraduate standard of writing. You're not supposed to begin a sentence with a number. You should be able to understand why before you can be able to internalize and not do what is not conventional when it comes to academic writing. And that brings us to the end of topic four. Once again, thank you and stay safe. Now we move on to topic five. And in our previous lesson, we were looking at postgraduate standards of writing. And we saw what is essential when it comes to postgraduate standard of writing. The conventions are very critical and there are certain issues that we must put into perspective now let us look at the essential writing skills. In our topic five, we focus on essential writing skills. Academic writing requires that you are skilled in identifying and presenting complex ideas and arguments. You're going to look at theories, you're going to look at ideas, from different perspectives and it is important that you should know how to present these complex ideas and arguments. Now what are some of the essential skills? We have three major skills that are critical and the first one is summarizing. 
you must be able to summarize your work. Summarizing is presenting the idea of another writer in a reduced manner, capturing the essential ideas and presenting them in the same voice and style as the original writer. A summary is generally about a quarter the length of the original article. And to summarize successfully, you need to understand the original writing very well so that you are able to adequately summarize it's important to understand the original article very well the essential then the next the, the the other essential skill is paraphrasing and paraphrasing means to restate information using different words like summarizing though, paraphrasing focuses less on shortening or condensing the information. Paraphrasing aims to rewrite the information by drawing on different words and phrases. In other words, for the summary, the words will be condensed. For paraphrasing, you could have the same length of the paragraph, but in other words. Also, it will be expected that you know how to structure your work. And we have already mentioned that the structure of an academic piece will involve an introduction, the middle, and the conclusion of that particular work. Therefore, the structure of an academic paper must have those three elements which are very critical in academic writing. We have focused on essential writing skills, majorly summarizing, paraphrasing, and structuring. And that brings us to the end of topic five. In topic six, we look at other essential skills that are equally very important in academic writing. And these are the skills of cohesion and coherence. Cohesion in writing refers to creating a tying kind of to the words and the phrases and the sentences and the paragraphs together so that you can create a text where relationships between these elements is clear is logical to the reader and is giving the text how. You cannot have a paragraph, paragraphs that are so different, talking about so many issues at the same time. Each paragraph should have a particular theme that should be connected to the next paragraph in the process of writing. The ideas must be coherent, must be cohesive. Now coherent, on the other hand, in writing is the logical bridge between words. The way in which you connect one word to the other, the way in which you connect one sentence to the other, the way in which you connect one paragraph to the other. So coherent writing uses devices De devices to connect ideas within each sentence and paragraph. Some of the devices that we normally utilize include words. Words such as however, but, then. Those are some of the words that will help us to establish and maintain cohesion and coherence in our work. They help us to connect ideas, to connect sentences and paragraphs, and they help us to develop a cohesive argument from our work. Now, transitional words can be used between paragraphs. And as I've already mentioned, we have words such as therefore, however, Yet, thus, first, later, 
then among others when you develop your argument you are confirming your position you are building your case you are using empirical evidence you are using facts and statistics to support your claim you are appealing to your audience in a rational manner in a logical manner you are linking your argument so that you can be able to have statistics that will support that particular argument and therefore make it an authority of your evidence in research and that is very very critical now how do you build an argument when you need to build an argument we can use the seven C's to develop and support a position about a specific topic first you can consider the situation in developing your argument consider the situation and then clarify your thinking so that you are able to have a perspective it is essential to clarify your thinking and then construct a claim when you construct a claim we are able to determine your positionality then collect evidence and consider the key objections the objections will enable you to have the pros and the cons and then craft your argument so that we can be able to see that it is the case and lastly confirm your main point the confirmation of your main point will be in your conclusion and that is what will determine your positionality with regard to that writing and that brings us to the end of topic 6 in our topic 7 we want to determine how to draft edit and proofread you've already done your groundwork you have written your assignment you need to edit it, edit it you also need to proofread it now the seven stages of writing are we have planning drafting sharing evaluating revising editing and publishing you've already done the planning the lecturer gave you the assignment you've done the planning you've gone to the library you have researched the literature you have gotten what you need and therefore you have to draft the content and drafting is the second step of the writing process now what is entailed in drafting first you must write a complete rough draft the rough draft do not try to fix it because when you try to fix it you'll not be able to finish up you must be able to take risks don't make it perfect use this step to see where the story can go even if you have an outline now things are not always planned and therefore do not worry about the word count or the words that you're going to utilize in the writing process in the drafting stage do not give up keep writing write everything that you think is relevant to that particular idea that you're conveying there will be more than one draft in a story you will do the first draft the second draft maybe the third and even the fourth before you do the final editing for the purpose of remitting your assignment but things do not always go as planned and therefore do not worry about the word count don't give up keep writing then once you have written your draft move on to the next stage which is editing 
And editing, we can define editing as a stage of writing process in which a writer or an editor strives to improve the draft by correcting the errors and making words and sentences clearer, more precise, and as effective as is possible. Editing, that is. Now, what about proofreading? Proofreading means careful checking of errors in a text before it is published or shared. It is, ve it is the very last stage of revising a text. When you fix minor spelling and pu punctuations and the mistakes, the typos, the formatting issues and inconsistencies, that is what we refer to as proofreading. So we can distinguish between editing and proofreading. Editing makes it more clearer and proofreading ensures that the typos are eliminated in the process. Now that is very critical because in your academic writing you have to draft, you have to edit, and then you proofread. Now what happens after you have proofread? That brings us to the end of our topic seven. We move on to topic eight. And in our topic eight, we are talking about technical documents. You are still writing. We write and write until we finish. So when we are talking about the technical documents, or technical writing is a type of writing where the author is writing about a particular subject. This particular subject requires direction. It requires instruction or explanation. This style of writing has a very different purpose and different characteristics than the other, the other types of writing. For example, we have the thesis or the proposal. That is a technical document. And for the thesis, we have a structure that the student has to follow when it comes to the writing. Now, I wouldn't know where you would like to categorize the thesis because it is an academic writing, but at the same time, it is specific. It has a specified structure, and it is for a specific purpose. And that's why we also categorize it as a te technical writing. Now, the main difference between an academic writing and a technical writing is the purpose. The main features, the structure and the application. When we look at the thesis, it is for the purpose of fulfilling the requirements of the postgraduate degree. The features are given in the Mount Kenya University Postgraduate Handbook. The structure is well outlined and the application you cannot graduate without having written your thesis. So the thesis becomes very, very critical. But we also have other types of technical writing. Like we have software installation guides. We have the standard operating procedures. We have the legal disclaimers. We have certain company documents. We have reports and help files, which are very critical. And we can term all those as technical writing. So technical writing becomes very, very critical to us as academicians because at the end of the day, they enable us to impact on the society. And one thing that we must take note of, even as we come to the end of this particular unit, is the fact that 
we must utilize the anti-plagiarism software to determine just how much we have plagiarized. And in a situation where you have more than 17%, then it means that that work will not be acceptable as an assignment or to the postgraduate school as we progress on. Now we come to the last topic. You have written your journal. You have written your thesis. You have done your research. And now you need to present it. That information has to be disseminated. And to disseminate that information, you must be able to come up with a good PowerPoint slide that will enable your audience to understand what you are trying to communicate to them. So I will show you how you can be able to avoid the pitfalls of bad slides. We are going to cover the outlines, the slide structure, the fonts, the color, the background, the graphs, the spelling and grammar, the conclusions, and possibly have a few questions for guideline. As you develop your PowerPoint slides, you should make your first or second slide as an outline of your presentation. And outline in this case, we are, what we mean is that you're going to show your audience what you are going to talk about during that particular time. Then you also need to follow the order of your outline for the rest of the presentation. As you present to them, you should be able to go as per the outline that you have given to your audience and only place the main points on the outline. You can use the titles of each slide as the main points so that the titles of each slide will form the outline of your presentation. Then secondly is the structure. A good structure should use one to two slides per minute of presentation. Write in point form, not complete sentences. You should be able to include four to five points per slide. Avoid wordiness. Use keywords and phrases only in your slide. Now what we have here is a bad slide. This page contains too many words for a presentation slide. It is not written in point form. It makes it difficult for both the audience to read and for you to present each point. Although there are exactly the same number of words and points on this slide as the previous one, it looks much more complicated. In short, your audience will spend too much time trying to read this paragraph instead of listening to you. So this is an example of a bad slide. And this is an example of a good slide. It has the points, it has the facts, and it is not congested. In a good slide, you should be able to show one point at a time, for this will help the audience to concentrate on what you are saying. It will also prevent the audience from reading ahead. It will also help your audience to keep focused on the presentation that you are giving. A bad slide will have animation which will be very distracting. Now the animations might even go overboard and the animations might even be inconsistent. And when they are in that order, then your audience will not concentrate. Now when it comes to the fonts, use at least an 18 point font 
at least. Use different font sizes for the main points and secondary points. Point 24 for the main point, point 28 for the sub points, point, po font 36 for the main title, so that they are not the same. Then use a standard font like Times Roman or the Arial and be consistent through the presentation. Now look at these font sizes. If you use small font, your audience won't be able to read what you have written. If you capitalize everything, then look at how it will, it will look. When you have a complicated font, that is how it will appear. Now this is bad font use. Then when it comes to color, use a color of font that contrasts sharply to the background. Blue font on a white background, how does that look? Use a color that will provide a logical structure to your work. Light blue title and dark blue text, what will that look like? Use color that will emphasize on the points that you are trying to put across. But only use different colors occasionally and for the purpose of emphasis. Like look at this, we have the bad colors. Look at yellow against white. Using color for decoration. Now this one is distracting and in some cases very annoying. Using different color for each point. Is, this is not necessary in academic presentation. <laughs> now, when it comes to the background of your PowerPoint, use backgrounds such as this that are simple. Use background which are light. Use the same background consistently all throughout your presentation. Look at that background. Very bright, you cannot even read the words. This is bad background. When it comes to the graphs, use graphs rather than just charts and words. Data in graphs is easier to comprehend and retain than in raw data. The trends are easier to visualize in graph form. And always title your graphs. Let us see. Look at that kind of graph. This has been given as a bad kind of graph. It is very small at the middle of a very large <laughs> screen. Now look at this. This is a good graph that has been presented. It is showing the disparities. It is showing the grids very clear. It is well spaced. The x-axis and the y-axis are very clear. Now look at this. This is a bad graph. And it is bad because of the color rings, the colors that have been utilized. They are not so attractive. So a bad graph is characterized by minor grid lines, which are not necessary. The fonts are too small. The colors are illogical. The title is missing, <laughs> like in that case. And the shading is very distracting. Now let's talk about spelling and grammar. Proof your slides for spelling mistakes, the use of repeated words, the grammatical errors that you might have made. If English is not your first language, please have someone else to check your presentation before you do the actual presentation. 
and in conclusion, use an effective and strong closing so that your audience can be able to remember what you talked about, your last words. Use a conclusion slide to summarize the main points of your presentation. Suggest future avenues of research even as you do your presentation. End your presentation with a simple question so that you can be able to invite your audience to ask questions. Provide a visual and a during question so a during question uh, period so that your audience can be able to ask questions and avoid ending a presentation abruptly. As a postgraduate student, you are well endowed for the purpose of presenting your proposals and your thesis at the departmental level, at the school level, and at the postgraduate level. Wish you all the best. And that brings us to the end of our topic nine. And thank you for listening. Stay safe. Thank you. These televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.